All right, hello, uh, little Friday, a little bonus video because I threw, I know you're like, yay. Uh, I, I crammed everything into Wednesday. I think I just got confused. So next week I won't get confused or I will. We'll have to wait and see. But I thought I would just spend a few minutes showing you guys if anybody's watching, uh, showing you a couple of trinkets I have that relate to stuff we've been talking about recently. Now, I have this book. I probably just, oops, something fell out. Oh. Uh, so, so I have this book, and this book is full of all the Hot 100 charts of the 60s. I also have one for the 70s. And the sun is streaking in the window and making me look more interesting than I am. Well, um, this book, though, I told you about the charts and that the charts are... Every single week, they come out with the listing of the most popular songs in the country. How they determine chart placement varies from time period to time period. Like I've been telling you, in the 50s, 60s, quite frankly, even up until uh, the, the early, very early part of the 2000s, um, charts were compiled and they often reflected um, a delayed truth. In other words, by the time that data got compiled, the situation had shifted, you know? So, you know, an example is if I tell you I have $100 in my bank account, but it takes me a week to tell you, and during that week I spend $20, then I no longer have 100, I only have 80, but you hear 100 because that's the information that comes to you. So by the time you get the information, what you know and what's true are two different things. Well, it was the same thing with the music charts. I cannot believe this sun. I can't, it was the same thing with the music charts that um, uh, because of technology at the time, which was rudimentary at best, charts didn't often reflect the truth. So. These are those charts, though, that I was talking to you about. It's a book that has all of the charts of the 1960s in it from the very first chart, uh, January 4th, 1960. The number one song was a song called El Paso by a great country and Western artist named Marty Robbins, all the way up to music we've not yet even gotten to that we won't get to until chapter 8, chapter 9, and the last chart of the 1960s, now this one, December 27th, 1969, and the number one record in the United States was a song called Someday We'll Be Together by uh, Diana Ross and the Supremes. So, but I thought you might like to see, I spent a fair amount of time in class talking about the onslaught of the Beatles and how they monopolized the charts in a way that nobody else ever had. And so I thought I would show you some high points. Um, if you see here, I hope you can see, I'm blocking my face, so I can't even tell if you can see or if this is just ridiculous. I think you can see enough. If you look here, where is it? Right here, number 45. I want to hold your hand. That debuted... January 18th, 1964. That was the first appearance by the Beatles on an American record chart. And the following week, January 25th, you can see, shaboom, there's I Want to Hold Your Hand. It moved up from number 45 to number three. And the following week, we've got the number one record in the nation. And if you remember, because of the Beatles' multiple small contracts and the number of sort of... Um, recordings that they had in vaults of different small record companies, the Beatles wound up having simultaneous records released 
by a variety of record companies. And it would take until April 4th. But let me take a look here. Yeah, the week before that, the week of March 28th, you can see there's the Beatles with the top four. And if you look further down at number 27, it's the debut of Can't Buy Me Love. And the week after that, the week of April 4th, the Beatles have the top five records in the nation. And it's the only time anybody's ever done that. And it was a confluence of events. It was the sort of perfect storm of the charts. Um, all of those little contracts that the Beatles had had, all the recordings that they had in the vaults of VJ and Tolly and, and other record companies um, before Capital, you know, fully owned their contract. And so there was that. It was the incredible popularity, the, the just pure monopolization of the pop consciousness that the Beatles that the Beatles had. So I thought you might like to see that. And the only other thing I could think of that I have, if you see around the upper part of my wall, here in my study in my house, I have, those are 45 records. And one that I have here, hang on, hang on. Uh, is... Our friends, the Beatles, the very song that in question, that's the Can't Buy Me Love record, backed with You Can't Do That. And it's not, I don't think it's financially valuable. No, it's not. Because, you know, you know how this stuff works, you guys. For collector stuff to be valuable, it has to be in the original packing. It has to be, you know, completely unused. Trust me, this was used, you can tell. And, but I just wanted to show you. So it's not about the value, the dollar value. It's about the connection to popular music. It's about the connection, for me, it's about the connection to my past. It's about the connection to my siblings because I was a little kid when this came out, but this reminds me of my older um, brothers and sisters and, you know, just loving the music. So, that's it. I'll be quiet. Have a great weekend. Next week, chapter eight. If you've not done the quiz, get on the quiz. Watch the other videos. Keep the quiz at hand. It's pretty straightforward, but you do have to, you do have to uh, be reasonably awake to do it. Okay. And get the quiz into me by tomorrow noon. That I'm not going to flex on at all. So, all right. The doors close at noon. Have a good one. Stay safe. And I'll, uh, I'll see you. I'll see you Monday.